Griff, always good to see you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the dogs. We are into uh, spring practice. We're heading into April in a couple of days, and we'll start getting a lot more information. So give us uh, what you know about the practices so far. Well, Georgia's got work to do. I mean, I mean, I know they go in into the next season as a preseason number one. I know that Kirby Smart uh, hasn't lost a regular season game since 2020. I know that there's no active coaches in college football uh, that have beaten Kirby Smart since 2018, now that Nick Saban has retired and Dan Mullen is off doing what he does and Ed Ordron is jogging along the beaches of Miami Beach on the boardwalk. Saw that firsthand, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, this is a the, the preemptive pick is always Georgia. And yet when I look at this team, Paul, I think they've got a lot of work to do. Carson Beck, uh, maybe the co-favorite for the Heisman Trophy, depending on what Las Vegas book you look at with, with Quinn Ewers there at Texas. But I don't think Carson has the supporting cast that he had a year ago. And I certainly don't think that he had the supporting cast that Stetson Bennett had when George won back-to-back -back titles. So a lot on Carson Beck's shoulders and Kirby Smart trying to develop a, a more fearsome uh, front four. You saw that headline from dognation.com. You played right before I came on. Uh, remember, Georgia was a team that led the nation in run defense, I think, four out of five years. They were second the other year. Last year dropped all the way to number 18, made it a little tougher on their DB. So they got to find some defensive linemen. Uh, they got to have some wide receivers emerge for Carson Beck to show off that NFL arm. And then they got to get a little lucky. Uh, they've got arguably the toughest schedule in the league when you consider that they open with Clemson neutral site, but then they play at Kentucky, at Alabama, at Texas, at Old Miss, and then they've got a really good Tennessee team that I think a lot of people are sleeping on that comes into Sanford Stadium November 16th. Remember, uh, it wasn't so long ago, I guess Butch Jones was able to beat Georgia in Sanford Stadium in what, 2016. So if Hypo can get that pass attack going again with this transfer quarterback, that will also be a test for Georgia. Griff, let's talk a little bit about what you're hearing because you, you, you make the rounds. I think the last time we had you on, you were just uh, spent some time in Gainesville. You have yeah. uh, ears everywhere. What are you hearing around the SEC right now? Well, I think Florida's got some good momentum. You know, I, I know that Billy Napier has, uh, you know, been very positive uh, in, with the local media. And, and, and I know the Gators feel like they have as much talent as they've had since Dan Mullen's final year. Now, how do they put it together? You talk about a tough schedule. <laughs> Look at the back end of the Florida schedule. The Gators really have to come out of the shoot fast, probably win four out of their first five to give them a fighting chance. And yet, this is a team that did lose Trevor Etienne. Uh, they lost some guys, but, but sometimes, Paul, it's addition by subtraction. But Etienne is not a guy that Billy Napier wanted to lose. I, I think if you look at the first half of the schedule, it's doable, right? Sanford, A&M at home, at Mississippi State, you're 3-0. and You got an off date before you play Gus Malzahn at home. Surely you win that game. Now you're 4-0. and And then the big game in Knoxville. I think that's a pivotal game for Billy Napier's future. He beat Tennessee last year in the Swamp. I think he needs to come up and beat Tennessee in Knoxville to get the kind of momentum he's going to need to keep his job. Kentucky the following week, another open date, and then let's just uh, turn the lights out on the back half of the season, and Florida's hoping they've got six or seven wins by then. So, Griff, if I, if I hear you correctly, the, the Tennessee game, which I don't think too many people have as a win for Napier, it, that's critical because of the gauntlet starting November 2nd? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and, and Paul, you know as a, as a journalist and a former Tennessee student, what the Florida Tennessee game has meant for decades. Uh, even when Georgia was dominating the East, there, there was a lot of bragging rights. You know, when Tennessee had the breakthrough and, and beat the Gators here at Neyland Stadium under Heupel, that was big. And it was big for Billy Napier that they were able to beat the Vols last year in the Swamp. That was a game I think ETN went for 172. I mean, that gave Florida people some confidence. Hey, at least we can still beat Tennessee, they said last year. They didn't beat many other teams, but they did get the ball. If they come up to Knoxville and lose next year, and then they go into that gauntlet of a schedule, I think it's lights out for Billy Napier. But, you know, here's the thing. Now that the SEC has made this scheduling decision, Paul, their schedule next year is just as tough. It's just flipped around as far as whether the games are home or away. A bit of a surprise to me. You, you mean the SEC decision to stay at eight? Well, not just the decision to stay at eight, but to keep the same opponents because right. we've been trending towards playing more different teams. The objective was for these kids to come in and play all the different schools over the course of their four years' careers. As it's been explained to me, this is kind of a temporary situation. Uh, it's the cleanest way to do it while there's still an eight-game schedule. 
And it's a good barometer to see how the college football playoff evaluates these SEC teams. Are they going to take a three-loss SEC team over a one-loss ACC team, perhaps, that didn't play much of a schedule? Or does the SEC recognize that, wait a minute, can't afford to add that ninth game because they're going to try to say that the SEC schedule is apples to apples with some of these weaker conferences. And if that's the case, then it's going to be real hard for the SEC to expand from an eight to a nine game league schedule. Speaking of that, Griff, uh, and I realize we're two months away from, from Destin where a lot of this will be front burner, but a lot of people are, are watching that debate because of all the uncertainty, especially in the ACC, where there's so much litigation, uh, you halfway expect Judge Judy to show up at media days. What, 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 what do you think the future looks like of both of those leagues? Well, you know, I think the ball is going to be largely in ESPN's uh, court to some extent, Paul. I mean, the ACC has a contract with ESPN, and I can't help but think that somehow that figures in, uh, as the SEC is obviously also a, an ESPN television property so what do the powers that be want and how quickly is college football moving you know maybe to the two super conferences instead of four I, you know Clemson and Florida State here's the thing uh, from a standpoint of their tradition and the success those programs that may have it makes sense for them to be in the SEC but when you look at the size of their television markets in Tallahassee and Clemson South Carolina they don't offer a lot and the SEC already has schools in the state of South Carolina and Florida. So you've got to wonder how do they value those teams versus maybe bigger market teams. Maybe the SEC could pull a team from the state of Virginia where they're not already at, or certainly North Carolina would be an attractive target for the SEC and the Big Ten. Talking to Mike Griffith, Mike, Mike before you go, we had a, a reporter on from Auburn yesterday, and I heard a lot of an, uh, enthusiasm from her based on what she has heard from Hugh Freeze, but it's still, Seems a, this has been a sloppy transition here uh, from Brian Harson to Hugh Freeze. Uh, he pretty much deep sixes, and not his entire, but most of his staff. What, what, do you, what do you make out of the Auburn Tigers? Well, as you know, it's always a combustible situation, and the Cadillac Williams uh, turnover, release, whatever you want to say, that didn't fit well with some folks. Look, bottom line, Hugh Freeze has to win football games, and he showed he could be competitive against Georgia and Alabama, but he didn't beat either one of those teams. He was very close uh, to beating both of those teams. And, you know, Caleb DeBoer now, I'm hearing all this momentum out of Tuscaloosa. And, you know, Paul, I kind of kind of flipped a little bit on this. I thought about this for a minute. What if, what if Kalen DeBoer really is that good of a coach? Consider the job that Nick Saban did last year, probably not his best job when you consider they really didn't know what Jalen Milrow could do until after they lost to Texas by 10 points. I mean, if that team is coached right and coached well, they should probably beat Texas at home by 10. So, so now I'm starting to wonder a little bit about Alabama. And, you know, again, all the enthusiasm I'm hearing, they say things are better than ever there. And you're asking me about Hugh Freeze. And, uh, you, I mean, you know how the pendulum goes. I mean, if Alabama's up, Auburn's down. And uh, I, I think this is a big year for Hugh Freeze, certainly. And, and we know it's a big year for Alabama, at least as long as, Nick Saban is content to be out of football and, and not interested in returning to head coaching. Yeah, Griff, um, a lot of people in our business felt like last year was one of Nick Saban's best coaching jobs. And you just said, if I, if I remember it correctly, that if Alabama had been coached right and coached well, did, did I hear you correctly? Yeah, I think that they were a better team than Texas last year. Okay. I don't know if, if there's Alabama fans out there that think Texas – would have beaten Alabama uh, seven out of 10 times. I'd like them to raise their hand. And, you know, I was just looking at the NFL draft board, Paul, and there's two or three Alabama guys projected in the first round. And other than the Michigan quarterback, who I, I have questions about, I didn't think he was that spectacular. I'm not so sure that Alabama didn't have more talent uh, last year. I know that the Alabama team that I saw beat Georgia, beat Georgia head to head. Uh, that version of Alabama was as good as any team I saw in the country last year. And, and I didn't see that team in the playoffs. And I didn't see that team when they played Texas. And I guess what I'm saying is I feel like Nick Saban has set such a fantastic uh, standard that when they don't clearly outcoach somebody, I kind of wonder if something is amiss. So kind of wondered a little bit about that last year. Yeah, I know I'm probably slipping a little bit, Griff, but you said something else a minute ago um, <laughs> that I couldn't help but, but make note of in my head. Uh, Nick Saban, if, uh, did you say he would be content 
to, to stay retired and not come back. Uh, is, I know you, you said that a couple of weeks ago, but uh, are you doubling down on that? I just, listen, Nick Saban is the greatest coach, Paul, uh, of, of my professional career the last 30 years. When you look at the number of national championships that he's won and his ability to win in different places. And I don't know, I just, I, I, a guy like that competes. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Jurassic Park, yeah. but there's a part of that movie where one of the lines is T-Rex doesn't want to be fed. I don't think Nick Saban wants to sit on a beach and be fed. I think this guy's the ultimate competitor. And I think it's hard for him to sit on the sideline. And I think it's going to be even harder next year. You know, maybe the first couple shows what he says on ESPN will be funny, uh, but then eventually his picks won't be relevant and he won't feel as important. And he certainly won't feel as involved. And I just think this guy's got some gas left in the tank. I'm, I'm not saying he can operate under this ridiculous schedule they've got right now. And, and football is a little uh, wild west right now, and that's not Nick's style. But you give this guy a year, I just wonder. I, I, I'm just, I'm not putting it out of the equation that there's a possibility. I just, I want to leave that but, but, door but Griff, open. You, 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 you have heard what he has had to say, his visit to Congress yeah. a couple of weeks ago. He seemed like yeah. he was burying his team and, and, and saying, <laughs> even though he didn't say that, the day after he retired. Now, we still haven't had a press conference with him like most coaches, um, <laughs> but uh, it just seemed like he, he had had enough of college football based on his appearance in front of the Ted Cruz committee. Well, you know, I'll just say, you know, Nick Saban is like anybody else, Paul. He's human. You know, there's days we get up and, you know, the job seems a little tougher. And then there's days like today when I'm back in Knoxville and, and covering a, a great college baseball game and seeing family members and talking to you and I say, man, life just doesn't get any better, right? And, and maybe Nick Saban, because of the frustrations that he had with last year's team, getting beat by 10 points at home against Texas, losing to Jim Harbaugh, you know, that, that's, you know, losing to Michigan, for him to go out that way, it's, it's poetic in the wrong way. Because he got ran out of the state of Michigan when he was the Michigan State head coach by Michigan. And, and to see him lose to Michigan in a final game, to me, in, in my sports writer brain, that's just not the happy ending that a guy like Nick Saban should have or would have. Now, I don't know that he'd go back to Tuscaloosa. Uh, I don't know what, again, uh, who knows? Maybe uh, maybe this next coach is going to do such a great job they, they, they don't want to make any changes anymore. Or maybe it's such a mess that, that Nick wants to go somewhere else. Or maybe there's another program that, that recognizes the opportunity to hire Nick Saban and says, whatever it takes, this is the greatest ever. Let's have him at our spot. But, but it's all speculation. And, and I'm not trying to, to start any fires out there. I'm just saying I don't underestimate Nick Saban after all that I've seen from him. And, um, and, and I think we're doing him a disservice if we say that last year was one of his best coaching jobs because I know I've seen some Alabama teams that were incredibly well coached. It didn't lose games like they did at home to Texas and certainly wouldn't lose to a Michigan team. We'll leave it there, Griff. I know you have a game to cover. Uh, thank you very much. Happy Easter. Great to have Griff on from Knoxville.